Welcome back, my friends. My name is Steve, and this is Embrace the Question. What we're doing with this series of videos is leading you through an episode, one at a time, of The Chosen. For those of you that uh, have been with me for a while, you are well aware of what we do, but for those that are new, what we do is we watch the video and we pick out the important parts of it and sometimes the, the interesting parts and comment on those, shed light on what we like about them, what we don't like about them, what may or may not be factually correct. We just have fun with it. If you are a Bible student and you like to study, then check out some of my other videos. I have an entire playlist devoted to Bible study materials, to uh, little known facts, and I also have a book that I've written that might help you to, uh, to study if you've never actually writ read the Bible through. Let's get into the last, the last episode of The Chosen that we have really to focus on. Season 2, Episode 8, and that is entitled Beyond Mountains. It's an interesting one, guys. Not to say that I won't come back and redo Episode 1 of Season 1, because I still need to do that, and we need to talk about the Christmas special. If you haven't seen that one, it's airing tonight for free, so check it out. Let's go. Let's see what it's like. Forty talents, and you can keep the Western Ridge for whatever it is you love so much about it. It's a beautiful view of the sunrise. Well, you can't eat a sunrise. Believe me, I know. What is your lineage? We are here to talk price, not family history. This is about my family. Your tribe. Simeon? These acres have been under the tribe of Reuben for 40 generations. I'm not about to surrender it to the little brother. <laughs> we can talk ancient birth order all you want, but it won't put a meal on your family's table. 55 talents. 45. We'll send a team of servants to help you move. What is it that you want from this land? All rocks. Barely anything grows here. That's right. But things that do grow, what happens to them? All that grow? Eventually. They die. We're here to cut tombs into these rocks. For the middle class. All the way out here. Only the wealthy can afford tombs close to the cities. And more and more of the middle class are dying. Deep in tax debt. Left with no money for a proper burial, these families are surrendering their beloveds to pauper's graves. We're here to provide an affordable solution. Even if it's far away, it's better than a pit entwined with other disintegrating bones. What's to stop me and my sons from carving the tombs? Why haven't you? Do you have the tools? The expertise? Capital for hiring laborers and dozens of stonecutters? Fifty talents. Forty-seven. Final offer. Forty-nine. Suppose you find copper and lead when you do. I said 47. You can contact me tomorrow when you change your mind. Wait. He has a point. The land could be worth more if there's something underneath, like he says. Copper or salt. He's not wrong. Our business has a reputation of doing things the right way. I'd be willing to part with a few more talents on the off chance there is something valuable under all this rock. This is all the promised land. No matter how it looks to you. 49. More than 10 years wages, Hushan. Let's draw up the covenants. What's wrong? That word, covenant, I was thinking about the promise made to Abraham. 
and all the other promises. And you can talk to your rabbi about that. For now, let us close the covenants and toast a fair deal for everyone. Well, that's an interesting intro. At this point, we really don't know if it's contemporary to the story of Jesus or if they flashed us back again. It was prohibited for a Jewish person to sell their land to someone from a different tribe. That's why the man was asking, from which tribe do you belong? As we can plainly see, the man was in some sort of financial dire straits and had to have the money. So he was considering, if not giving in to the pressure to sell the land to a different tribe, even for quite a bit of money. The second, the second thing worthy of mention is the, the graves. They said they were going to use the land to cut graves. Why? They did not bury people in the ground during that day. They were, the ground was not really diggable. You had to carve graves into the side of the hills. The, the hills were made of rock. And so you found tombs that had to be carved. And because the space was somewhat limited to places where they could guard, they, they had to reuse tombs. So they made tombs where after a while, after the bodies have decomposed, they would remove the bodies, remove the bones, and put them into small boxes called ossuaries and place those in burial shelves like mausoleums, but also carved out of the side of a mountain, usually somewhere. So graves were used, usually meant to be reused, which is why you had stones in front of them that could be moved back and forth. You could get in and out. Jesus uses that illustration at one time to speak to the Pharisees and the teachers of the law and say, you guys are just like ossuaries. You're like graves full of dead men's bones. You, you're pretty and white on the outside, but inside you're just full of death. And that's, that's where that illustration came from. So a lot of this history is kind of interwoven into this neat little intro that we have here. Let's see where it all goes. You're going to wake the whole camp with your chopping. Put the shirt on before the women get up. Oh, they're already up. I heard them studying in their tent. Why do the women feel so strongly about studying? Isn't it enough to just listen to our rabbi? When would they do that? He's never here. You know, your obsession with exercise? It smacks of Hellenism. I'm just trying to stay ready. What if the Romans change their mind and do what they did to your old rabbi? Can you please not bring that up? The mind and the spirit are more important than the body. How can you have a healthy mind if you don't have a healthy body? I'm talking about emphasizing one over the other. Try eating a whole bush of poisonous berries and then tell me how your mind is doing. What's with the chopping? Oh, did we interfere with sleeping in? Your sails are still full, I see. Sanctifies with his commandments and commands on the hands. Breakfast, boys. Blessed are you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe. We have plenty of wood, guys. The stack. For the next travelers. Tonight is going to be our last night here. It is? Yes. Rabbi told me last night. He told everyone. Where's Matthew? He went away early this morning with Rabbi. Why does he always take Matthew? And since when did you start caring about Matthew's whereabouts? Big Thunder just does the same thing. You didn't ask about everyone else. Did you sleep okay? Uh, it was like this when I woke up. Jesus sent little James, Thaddeus, and Nathaniel ahead to find a location for the sermon. All right. Do we all know what we're supposed to do? I don't know, Simon. Maybe listen. Keep talking to me like that. 
I know we'll need security on all four points of the compass. We know how to execute that, Z. The crowd is going to be bigger this time, the way the word is spreading. What do we do with hecklers? Uh, the odd Pharisee used to come to these things. They used to be all over John's sermons. John would heckle them. I just said used to. Jesus can handle Pharisees. We need to get this right, huh? No mistakes. My frame was not hiding hidden hidden from you when I was be I being made when I was being made in secret in in the woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my form, not my unformed substance. How do you have this memorized? I've been memorizing the rest of that song of David. Need more words, more tools. I can't let it happen again. Mary, you've got to stop dwelling on your eyes on my unformed substance. So my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me. My frame was not hiding. Well, let's stop there before they get too far ahead. First of all, the camp is a mess, as we can see. Everyone's at each other's throats. Nobody's at peace. Andrew's upset about John the Baptist. I, I'm assuming John the Baptist is still incarcerated by Herod. Do you think maybe they're angry because Matthew, the tax collector, is always with Jesus? And then there's the whole John thing. John is not happy. He's not a happy guy. There's no mistakes. Or is that Big James? No mistakes. It's like they are the personal bodyguard of the Son of God, and they still haven't learned that that isn't necessary. Plus, now we have Mary Magdalene that's still brooding, really, about herself. She's still not forgiven herself. She said something to the effect of, I can't let that happen again. She's... she's immersing herself, I think, into religious activities in an attempt to affect change on her own. That's what it is. And it's, it's almost like uh, Paul to the Galatians. Paul wrote to the Galatians, it's silliness to try to finish by the flesh what started in the spirit. Galatians 3, I believe. And that's what she's doing. She's trying to fill herself full of the word so that she can ensure that she never falls again. And it's a futile pursuit, unfortunately. So she is, she is at this point, really lining herself up to fall again. It's not really a, an easy thing for me to watch. But I'm assuming that this is all heading to something somewhat more pleasant. You and Mary have been so good to me. Oh, of course, we're happy you're here. I'm, do we all have to learn to read? No. Mary's father taught her long ago and Rayma just wanted to learn. I think they felt left out. Maybe you being here will take the pressure off. I'm, I'm willing to learn if that's what it takes. Shalom. I come bearing apricots. Ah, it's a good day today. <laughs> oh, no. Ah, thank you. Ah. 
Hello, Thomas. Ah, these are the lights. Shalom. Shalom. Having mine under the tent. Is Rema coming out? Uh, no, I don't think so. She's pretty intent on studying. Oh. Mary is writing leaflet notices and invitations and sometimes crying. She went through something bad. I think she just needs time. Mm. And what about them? In the most generous explanation, I'd call that love. <laughs> that does not look like love to me. <laughs> you know, they all love our rabbi and want to follow him the right way. They just can't agree on what that right way is. Thank you. I will take these to Raymond Mary. Oh, oh, and tell Rayma Philip found apples, but I wanted to bring her apricots. Because I know that her favorite. <clears throat> I will pass that along. It was perfection. You played your part so well. And my look of annoyance was the best I've ever given. Sophocles, Euripides, Aeschylus, they would kill for our acting skills. It certainly was a kind of tragedy. For him, for us, it was a, a triumph. And all tragedies have winners and losers. He was the one who brought up potential minerals. Yes! And then you acknowledged the possibility of salt and not giving anything away. I conceded the value, and we came off looking like good guys. Hmm. We bought a salt mine for the price of a country plot. Did you see his tears? That's common. People have emotional ties to the land. And then what, do we grow calluses on our eyes? They lighten up. We just made the best sale of our lives. He did make a tidy profit on land. He didn't know it would ever be valuable. He'll never have to work another day in his life. You know, when I brought you on as my apprentice, they neglected to tell me that you did not have a sense of humor. I do have a sense of humor. You are about to become a very wealthy man. Once our miners find the salt, we're going to live like kings. Kings of what? <laughs> There's only one true king in heaven, and everyone else, even Caesar, is enjoying illusions of power and wealth. Sooner or later, we all become dust. There's that sense of humor. Hey, I'm not oblivious, okay? I know that's right. But we have so few opportunities to get ahead in this world. Opportunity? War. It was a calculated deception. And it didn't... It didn't feel good. We used what God gave us, and now we'll have greater choices, we'll live better lives. More devotion. Finish your drink. Man was formed from Earth, and eventually he returns to it. The time in between. There has to be more to life than that. He's an orphan and a poet. I told you not to call me that. Hey. Okay, I'm sorry. It's been a long week. Let's take some time off to rest. What I need is a life I could be proud of. Don't you want to do something that will really matter? That will be remembered throughout history? I appreciate your ambition, I really do. And I see potential in you, I see it every day. Here's an advance. Let's take weeks off, rest, go for walks, do something new. Hmm? Really? Why not? You're the one that said there's more to life than making money. Thank you. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Finish your drink. Well, this does appear to be a contemporary story with our story of Jesus. So these guys are operating at the same time. We don't know who they are. Does look like I was right about the good cop, bad cop thing. Only the, the good cop isn't feeling good about the scam. We don't know who they are again. At this point, I was starting to guess who they were, because we, we still haven't called all the disciples yet. And you just get a sense that sometime before season two ends, we're going to need to call at least one more disciple. 
Well, I think uh, the only disciple not in the picture is Judas. We've called all the others, and they're happily getting along in the camp. So one of these guys is probably Judas, and you're probably thinking the same thing, but which one? We have one guy that is very... Mm, religious might be the wrong word. He fears God, you can tell it. And the other guy is a bit more brash, a bit more worldly, more into making money. Hmm. No telling, right? Which one is which? I think the knoll east of the Nahalka River looks promising. But it's a knoll. He won't be high enough for people to see and hear him. Yes, and the trees to the south obstruct the view of the Sea of Galilee, which he specifically requested. Why does he need a view of the sea? I think he wanted to be high enough up. Ah, what about the hills north of Chorazim? Huh? There's plenty of height his voice would carry. It's too steep of a climb. Ah. And the distance is too far for the people from Tiberius and Magdala. Yeah. He said he wanted to keep within a day's walk from those cities. Maybe we're just looking too far north. What did he request? A grove of uh, juniper or gum trees on the backside where we could camp the night before? Yeah. It's like he already knows the place, hmm? Yeah. Just have to find it. No trespassing. Violators will be prosecuted. Shalom, shalom. Oh, we mean no harm, sister. We're here on friendly business. Behind where you are. Is that a good view of the Sea of Galilee? Go away. That's not very friendly. Uh, excuse me, are you the owner? It's closed to visitors. It's very important that we speak to him. This is probably the spot. What? Why? It's completely repellent. Exactly. All right, so they found a plot of land that they're wanting to use for an event. And they're getting no response from the shepherdess that is there. One thing you might not know is that a lot of times in that culture, especially the ancient culture, the shepherds were women or girls. Usually girls. Because, and this is, this is where you have a, a vast cultural shift, it's because the families were afraid to lose sons, so they sent daughters to do the shepherding. Shepherding could be dangerous. They had to spend sometimes weeks in the wilderness to keep the sheep alive. They had to move the sheep around. They had to deal with the same dangers that we find David dealing with back in, uh, back in the story of, of David in the, in the Kings and the Chronicles, where David dealt with lions and bears, right? And sometimes robbers, sometimes uh, bad, bad shepherds that are trying to steal the sheep. So yes, uh, young girls were often the ones who kept the sheep. That also, incidentally, speaks to David's worth. He was the least of the sons. Jesse probably had no daughters, so who did he send to take care of the sheep? David. That was just the way it was. That's it? That's your whole story? Everything we know for certain established as fact by eyewitnesses in accordance with the law. <laughs> I know we can't prove it's the same person, but the pattern's too striking to ignore. It doesn't need to be the same person. That's what's wonderful. I will have Shimon dragged for this. To be fair, it was the secretary who called the charges Manusha, not Shimon himself. Secretaries don't put words in the rabbi's mouth. It's the other way around. Manusha. My congregation and students will foam at the mouth when they hear this. Make a written record of your conversation with Shimon's secretary. Every word and file it with the clerk of the Special Council for False Prophecies at the Archive. It must be signed and dated by a ranking Levite. Do you understand my instructions? Yes, but why all the exactitude? Because when this Jesus of Nazareth amasses enough followers and enough detractors, it will get Rome's attention. And then everyone will know. Know what, Rabbi? That Shimon was well aware of these offenses and dismissed them. 
his obsession with reforming God's immutable law will be exposed for the negligent, lazy, dangerous abomination it is. Not just Shimon. We opened a case with the Sanhedrin and Nicodemus dismissed it as immaterial. Nicodemus, I've long suspected the lamps were going dim in that house, if you get my meaning. Well, I don't know about that. I... Spread the word. Tell every scribe, Pharisee, Sadducee, Essen, priest, teacher, and Levite you know. Why, Rabbi? First, the facts. Self-identifies using a divine title from the prophet Daniel. Son of man. Claims authority to forgive sins. Violates Shabbat on multiple occasions. And commands others to do so. Eats with tax collectors and sinners. Degenerates. Now, the speculation. Spit it out, I don't have all day. One of John the Baptizer's students is among his followers, and there are rumors of a second. Delicious. We'll never be pestered by that freak again. In Capernaum, there were women of ill repute seen at table with him at the tax collector's house. You're telling me women are among his followers? You asked for speculation. Keep going. He consorts with Gentiles, specifically the Ethiopian woman who knew his name and his origin. The last is very vague and small. Nothing is small when it comes to fidelity to God's law. The praetor of Capernaum ordered Jesus detained when I spoke with his office, they made mention of the fourth philosophy. The zealots? It was just a passing comment. He must be out of his mind. That's all we have. You must make these confirmed facts and inferences made known far and wide, but never mention that Shimon or Nicodemus dismissed the case. The gullible masses will defer to their supposed wisdom, but then, when we reveal dated documentation showing that Shimon had early warning and did nothing, the house of his wretched grandfather Hillel will fall and the house of Shammai will rise. Rabbi Shammai, respectfully, we didn't come here today seeking to influence which schools of thought. We came looking for someone who would care that a false prophet is deceiving our people. If that was your intent, you have succeeded. Everything you've shared with me will make an appearance at my next Shabbat sermon. The continued story of Shmuel and trying to frame Jesus, trying to get Jesus incarcerated, basically. And they've done everything. They first went to the house of Hillel, and Hillel basically dismissed them. So now they're at the house of Shemai, and actually was just speaking to Shemai, uh, one, uh, one of the great rabbis with authority, Shemai. In at least the way they're depicting it here, Shammai has a real hatred for Hillel. He's, he's doing all of this to remove Hillel from the picture. It's not, about, it's not about friendly competition. It's not about the debate itself. It's about politics. It's about removing one's enemy. And I think that Shmuel is really uncomfortable here. He doesn't like the fact that this may go really badly for Nicodemus, although Nicodemus didn't help him. He resents Nicodemus, but he doesn't want to smear Nicodemus. And that's what's going to happen, apparently. So this is still not one of my favorite parts of the story, but it's somewhat interesting. Matthew. Look. Mary finished the notices. They're leaving to spread the word. I hope they can find a way to work together. What do you mean? They can't seem to agree on a single thing lately. Myself included sometimes. Oh, I've noticed. In some ways, it's to be expected. But not desired, surely. No, no. But it's what's bound to happen when you start something that's open to all, truly, all people. Zealots, even tax collectors. People who have been through tough times. People both hesitant and skeptical, as well as bold and confident. People hungry to learn as well as those learned and knowledgeable. Let's get back to work. How many sections are we up to? Nineteen. He's a little incomplete, huh? 
There is something about 20 that is more symmetrical. You could always shorten it to 18. Brevity is usually preferred. Which section stands out to you the most? Do not be anxious about your life, of course. Are there any sections that concern you? Give me your honest opinion. I know I don't have to say that, but... The whole truth. You know I won't be offended. It's... Well... Very striking. But if I do the math in terms of good news and bad, it seems like there's not a lot of good news. Anyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery. Doesn't that make everyone an adulterer? If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. Wouldn't that lead to an entire population of people walking around with only one eye? Oh, and this one. If anyone were to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Mm. Trees that bear bad fruit being cut down and torn into the fire. The gate is narrow and hard that leads to life. Depart from me, I never knew you. Do you realize how heavily laden your sermon is with these kinds of ominous pronouncements? I haven't even named half of them. It's a manifesto, Matthew. I'm not here to be sentimental and soothing. I'm here to start a revolution. Well, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. That isn't exactly- I said revolution, not revolt. I'm talking about a radical shift. Did you think I was just going to come here and say, hey everyone, just uh, keep doing what you've been doing for the last thousand years since it's been going so great. Also, there's the beginning and the end. What about the beginning? My concern about the beginning is more logistical. Right now your opening line is, you are the salt of the earth. I'm worried, particularly if it is windy, or if the crowd is larger than we expect, that people near the back will hear, salt the earth, and it will immediately call to mind a negative connotation. The Punic Wars? Yes. When Rome destroyed Carthage, they sowed the city with salt to make it barren and to curse anyone who would rebuild upon it. I share your concern about the opening line, but for different reasons. I think the sermon needs some sort of introduction, an invitation into what, as you have rightly pointed out, will be a complex and at times challenging set of teachings. What does you are the salt of the earth even mean? I'm not good at metaphor. Salt preserves meat from corruption. It slows its decay. I want my followers to be a people who hold back the evil of the world. Salt also enhances the flavor of things. I want my followers to renew the world and be part of its redemption. Salt can also be mixed with honey and rubbed on the skin for maladies. I want my people to participate in the healing of the world, not its destruction. Then why not just say that? <laughs> Come on, Matthew. Allow me a little poetry, huh? Not everyone is like you. Some people like a little flavor. Read the songs of David or, or Solomon. I'm not going nearly as far with metaphor as Solomon. I'm reading him next. Well, good luck. He's probably... <laughs> yeah. I told you. These things will make sense to some, but not to others. I don't want passive followers. Those who are truly committed will peer deeply into it, looking for truth. But I do agree with you. We shouldn't begin with salt. You make a valid point. Good work. You could flip it with the next image. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. I could. Or, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. That one's inviting. Master, may I ask why you keep coming down to look at the camp? They've all gone, haven't they? They have. I'm going to need time. That one I particularly love. Anytime I have a dialogue with Jesus and one other person, I zoom right in on that. It 
it's something about seeing Jesus completely in an intimate setting, I guess. Uh, you get the real Jesus. Uh, not that he's not real when he's with a crowd, but it's just something special about the one-on-one -on -one Jesus uh, scenes. And in this case, I like the little bit of of sarcasm that we see. Oh, that's uh, <laughs> when he's talking to Matthew about the last thousand years for for Israel and how well that worked out. But uh, I really enjoy I really enjoy that scene. There's something also Jonathan Rumi just pulls this off when he he goes solemn and he's looking at the the camp. And he watches them leave two by two. There's some interesting things about that as well. Matthew's concerned because nobody can seem to get along. And Jesus makes the remark, that's the way it is when you start something that's open to all, from zealots to tax collectors. Not everybody gets along. And what I understand about that is, is that Jesus... There are a lot of things about scripture and Christianity in general that are this way, which is we have a choice to make whether or not we are going to condemn others for their view of things that differ from our own, or are we going to receive them, accept them, and love them in spite of that? Could that be why why God left so many things open to debate. We like to separate on the, the smallest little details. We, we like to bash each other for contrary beliefs, often superficial beliefs. And the fact is, is that they are superficial. And we're going to choose to not fellowship with these people because of a superficial difference. That's what the disciples are going through right now. I think that scene right there explains a lot about the vagueness sometimes, the, the, uh, the gray areas that we find in our walks where nobody can seem to agree. Why God didn't you make that more black and white? Well, it's because we have to get over ourselves and decide to love someone even if we don't completely agree with them. That was a, a, it really became a heavy scene there at the end of it, where the camp is empty and Matthew is making some really interesting remarks about just the details of that sermon. We have measures in place for crowd control. And we can set aside some of our men to assist our goat herds and shepherds, keeping the animals corralled on the other side of the mountain. Mm. My goat herd told me about your plans. But I don't like preachers. I don't care for crowds. You're not even offering to pay for the use of my space. We have no significant money to offer. We may be able to secure a loan. May? We have some people in our group who are skilled at negotiation. Why don't you bring them? Do you know of any neighboring pastor similar to yours? Someone we could talk to. Look, I only came here because she said you'd pay for my drink if I heard you out, and I have. What about Product Association? What? If this man is as important as they say, and the sermon is as significant as they are predicting... I just don't care about any vagabond teacher. This is the man who's healed many, yes? The one we've heard about? Yes. Think of all the pilgrims that see him as more than a teacher. How many did you say? Hundreds? Perhaps thousands? Multitudes. Thousands of people having life-changing experiences on your land. They could see miracles. What happens when those pilgrims go to market for supplies? I mean, all those travelers, well, they associate your products with the feelings they have on the day. Coming from all over. Your products. Your milk, your cheese, your wool, huh? Your name will be the only name they can trust. Multitudes. Fine. But if I find one piece of trash left behind, I'll sue for damages. You have our word. We'll leave it better than we found it. 
Good. I can't believe it. Did we just get the land? I think we just got the land. <laughs> we got it. So how can we ever think? <laughs> you see, boy, I have not led you to ruin. Life is a negotiation. Hey, <laughs> you're right. You're right. Opportunities are everywhere staring us in the face. And the only difference between us and most people is that we have the tools to take advantage. Yeah, I'm learning. And I'm telling you, I don't want to be in business forever. I just want to make enough money to make my own choices. I'm like you. I believe there is more to life than deals and titles. You know what would be really interesting? What's that? See this preacher in person. I've been hearing about him. I'm really glad to hear you say that. I want to see him too. It's settled. That's a fun scene. I am provoked a bit by that scene. I wish that I were that quick to think. I wish I were that quick to speak. In that way, I wish I could see opportunity like obviously they saw opportunity right there at that table. And I'm, I'm the guy sitting at the table futilely trying to sell this guy my idea and I'm about to give up and actually ask for who his neighbor is so I can go beg from his neighbor. These two guys that are sitting at the bar, that's pretty interesting to me. I like that scene just because it, it provided some entertainment value. And uh, I, I can see a divine setup going here. I know you can as well. Pretty fun though. Oh, they're still Have we been advertising something that might not happen? What if he never comes back? We go to sleep and he's not here. We wake up and he's not here. Correction. When you wake up, he's not here. I've seen him live with Matthew every morning for the past week. I think he's just trying to get it right. Can he get anything wrong? I mean, for the people. What if we've all been misled? How can you say that? You saw what happened at Ghana. Everyone, calm down. I'm sorry, I'm just nervous. We're all tired from a long day. We need to rest for tomorrow and go meet the others at the mountain early to help set up. What if no one shows up? What if everyone shows up? Either way, Simon is right. We should rest. You think I'm going to get a wink of sleep? I just want to make sure I've done everything I can for him. You always do. He'll sleep well now. Well, that's an interesting sequence. For sure. The, the whole uh, spreading the word, these event planners, uh, all the disciples have become event planners. So they're all passing out flyers. That's my only real problem with it is I don't think they had paper. I don't, th there was paper, don't get me wrong. I don't think it was common and I don't think it was readily available. So I don't think that there were a lot of options to run over to Dollar General and buy reams of paper and pass them out even after you've spent hours manually writing out the flyers. 
I, that doesn't bother me. It's just something. It's a. It's a thing. It's a thing. I'm. I'm talking about it because I'm nitpicking. I really don't have a problem with that sequence at all. I think it's pretty cool. Uh, I think most of the time, word didn't have to be sp spread about Jesus and his events. Jesus was always sought out by the crowds. Word got out about Jesus. It only takes one or two people that get healed to start spreading the word, and that goes like wildfire. Can you imagine? I did like the little piece after where they're all speaking, and um, was it Simon that said, what if nobody shows up? And Mary Magdalene said, what if everybody shows up? And I get that. That's, that's a pastor thing, because what if, if, if you're dealing with limited seating in a venue, like I often am, and what if everybody shows up? Well, that would be a great problem to have, but it's a question it's, it's a question we ask a lot, which is, what if nobody shows up? What if everybody shows up? I thought that was funny. Matthew. Matthew. Bye-bye. I've got it. The opening? Yes. What is it? A map. The what? Directions. Where people should look to find me. Okay. Give me a moment. Mm.
play, I just clench up and hang on because I know it's about to get seriously heavy. That was an amazing, amazing... <laughs> That's just amazing writing. I don't know how you even come up with that. I don't even know how you come up with that. When Holy Spirit gave them that scene, they must have all just broken down weeping. I don't know how you even act that out. And the end part there where he looks at Matthew, talks about, blessed are you who are persecuted for my name's sake. People speak all manner of evil about you. And then Matthew looks up and he says, you are the salt of the earth. And Matthew begins to laugh. Whenever Matthew laughs, there's been a breakthrough. Because Matthew doesn't laugh very often. That's, that's the whole episode for me right there. And it makes me want to memorize the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount. Because that grants it context that I did not have before I watched that scene. Truly amazing. Jesus! Yes? Please come, we'd like to show you something. I'm preparing, Ima. Fine, we'll come to you. This material. This is no good. What? Why not? You'll blend into the rocks. To the people in the back, you'll be a disembodied voice coming from a slate quarry. You need a pop of color. <laughs> You know, I know what the prophecy says about my appearance. Is this your attempt to change it? Blue. The symbol of peace, like water in the sky. Hmm. Red. A symbol of passion, blood, sacrifice, love. Oh. Purple. The royalty. Kingship. Gold. Warmth. Wisdom. Light. The sun. Well, well, uh, we have no glass or no still waters to peer into for a reflection. And even if we did, I can't tell you how little I care about how I look. <laughs> Ima. Blue, the symbol of peace, our prince of peace. Rema. Purple, because of the night I first met you. Grapes, wine. Mary. Purple also. Royalty. Tamar. Blue. It's a calming color. Softens your hard edges. I have hard edges? <laughs> You've been known to say hard things. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait. Thomas says we're up to 3,000. Uh, people are showing up. It will be 4,000 by the time we start. In no time. Should we even tell him? I don't want him to be surprised when he comes around to his place. Was he capable of surprise or being thrown off? Oh, this is not good. 
If more people show up or if one more thing goes wrong, this could be a disaster. Am I allowed? Uh, later. Where's Dasha? She's with MD and some others. They secured a place at the front. Eden! Yes? Get over here. I need a tiebreaker. <laughs> this is Simon's wife, Eden. Shalom. <laughs> This is even bigger than I thought. Oh, I had a feeling. You had a feeling. I want to see him. Oh, I want to find a place we can hear him. I'll come and find you. I won't be long. See if we can find one of his followers, one of the men we met. Let them know we can help them. They clearly need it. They look like they're with him. Hey, excuse me, son. May I have a very brief word? This is amazing. Oh, uh, excuse me. Do you, do you know where I should stand to hear him? To hear the teacher from Nazareth. Nazareth? He performs miracles. They are saying he could be the one. We are not going to miss a word. You could do a lot worse than to follow us. Well, if it's kind, thank you. You know... Today is one of those days when it's definitely better to be blind and not deaf. I, I'm sorry, if, if we're moving to hear the teacher, why are you turning off the path the others follow? We're just going to say hello to some old friends before the show. Not a show, Barnaby. It was a show at Zebedee's house. Step back five cubits, everyone. Stay back and push no further. Hey, everyone, back. everyone, you're too close. Stay back. Five cubits back, everyone, please. And what if we don't? <laughs> you think we'd stay home for this? <laughs> Ima! <laughs> You look skinny. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm Are you not, eating? No, I am eating. Are you sure? Yes, yes, I'm fine. Oh. Where's James? He's, he's on the other side. I, I actually have to go then. Okay. okay, go. Okay, okay. <laughs> and, and, and no heckling, you two. No promises. Never. <laughs> We never got to see any of this. My father? Which one? <laughs> I don't know what I need. Mean. you say will be beautiful. It is pretty good, actually. <laughs> Heard some guy was gonna tell jokes on a hillside or something? They're not jokes. Pardon me. <laughs> you made it. Yeah. You made it. Good to see you. Yeah. Yeah. You made it. <laughs> Wait. It's you. You're the man Wait. from the public house. You're I, I just follow them. I don't actually know what I'm doing here. Come on over. Well, we just wanted to say shalom. We'll go find a good spot. Please. Stick around. Simon! <laughs> this 
He's the man who got us the mount and the pasture. Convinced the landowner it was worth his while. Ah, good work. I'm Simon. Judas. Welcome, Judas. I'm sure you're gonna love this sermon. Oh, I wouldn't miss it. Wow, man, that is so cool. I, I love all of it. I don't have anything bad to say about any of that. I think that is so amazing. It's just putting, putting a Holy Spirit eyes on something that really happened a long time ago where we never got any context. We never really got any details outside of Jesus got up, started speaking all these hard things, and people loved it and hated it all at the same time. And this made a lot of sense to me. I love the humanity of Jesus, where he's rehearsing and he's nervous and he's, he's apprehensive about everything, messing up in front of everyone. And I love what Andrew said. Can this guy even really be knocked off track? Or I don't know how he worded it, but it was... <laughs> that would have been my question too. Can you even rattle Jesus? Does he get rattled about anything? So cool. And then, and then Judas shows up. So we know, we know it's Judas. Did you get it right? Did you guess the correct one? I did only because Judas fit the profile of the other guy so well. So I figured they were going to do the switcheroo on us, and they did. And I like that that scene where he's he's walking up to the curtains to go and view the crowd. And he sees all of those that know him. And then there's Judas in the scene. And Judas is just like... <laughs> so well done, man. And I already hurt for Judas. I already hurt for him. Because I know what kind... I know the story of Judas. And I love this guy. Yeah. That's going to be a hard... A hard progression, I think, for all of us. That concludes season two. Wow. Uh, what what are your comments? What what do you think about that one? What what did you not like about it, if anything? I again I can't really pick anything out that I didn't like about it. Mm. Ready for ready for season three. I am going to re-release season one, episode one, because for me that's still one of the best. And I need to redo it with the video included, right? And uh, they are actually tonight making the Christmas special available for everyone. I don't know if it's going to stay available. I'm assuming so. But I, I'm going to just take the, the Christmas story part out of that and do a video on that, which is only about 20, 25 minutes, I believe. So, out of that two-hour special. 
but it was good. Again, if you haven't seen it, watch it, watch it, watch it. You'll love it. All right. Guys, thank you again for joining me. Thank you for always being there. Thank you for your comments. And uh, for those of you that uh, would like to support me, see the notes below. If you want to see, if you want to check out the book I wrote, it's in the notes below also. But uh, meanwhile, in the next week or two, be watching, uh, it'll be another week. I'll, I'll release season one, episode one. And until then, you guys be safe, have a happy holiday, and peace.